sponsored by Fieldstone Memory Care, Bainbridge Island. Fieldstone offers innovative and compassionate care. Now accepting residents, call 360-689-4314 to schedule a tour of Fieldstone's beautifully appointed apartments on Ruling Bay. And they're also doing day uh, visits also. So if you need some, somebody to go and just hang out at that place, there's day visits for like four hours or all day if you want that, because many Islanders are wanting that kind of service for people that live at home. And I also would like to acknowledge that the Senior Community Center is on the ancestral homeland of the Coastal Salish people, specifically the Suquamish people, the people of the clear salt water, and we honor them. Thank and you. we also honor Anne Lovejoy, a jewel of Bainbridge Island, the maven of landscaping. Welcome, Anne. Well, thank you, Karen. How am I going to live up to that? Um, and welcome, everybody. Thanks for showing up. As usual, I went out and gathered a few little flowers just to show you what survived the freeze. I was kind of dismayed to see quite a few things did not um, that I thought would, but a lot of them may come back. Um, or may not. Um, that combination of multiple freeze cycles is a little tough on plants because they recover from one, maybe or not, and then just get hit by another one. Um, and that sometimes turns them to mush, as you may discover. So if you're probing around in your garden and you've got the crown is really soft and mushy and you kind of gently pull and the whole thing comes off in your hand and there's just mush underneath, that's kind of the end of that story and it's ready for the compost. But if it's still firm and the roots feels firm, you may well get a return. So it's worth waiting and don't get too hasty about it. Um, but I wanted to show you a couple little things and say some stuff about them. And one is the little daffodils, the teeny ones that um, you can get them at the grocery store and stuff. They are very permanent plants. They don't care about freeze because many of them come from like high alpine regions or extremely um, hot, dry places in summer and cold, dry places in winter, and they're fine. So don't worry about them. But also I wanted to make a plug that if you do have a bunch of the little daffodils that maybe you bought at the store and you didn't have anywhere to plant them, if you want to contribute them to the senior center, we're renovating the beds and adding bulbs and things, and we'd be really happy to have them for the back of the garden this time. We're going to be doing a big renovation there. The other bulb I wanted to kind of call out is called not a snowdrop, but a snowflake. And they're bigger, they're 18 inches or so, and they're bloom later because snow, true snowdrops are kind of gone by by now. But the snowflakes last on often in, well into April and once in a while into May even, but they're nice because the early bumblebees love them. And you'll see little pollinators all over these things. Like all bulbs, they're very hardy, very tough. The only thing they want from you is to leave them alone and don't pull all their foliage off or braid it or cut it off too soon, but let them rot in peace. You can fold the leaves down if they really bother you. You can even sprinkle a little very loose airy compost or bark over them or something, but don't cut them off and don't, um, uh, don't mash them up. Like some people braid them and put an elastic on it. Really? It's not a toddler. Just don't do that. Um, the other beautiful plant that this one looks a little sad, but it came through the freeze. I was blown away. So this is a decayed anemone and they are the original lilies of the field from the Bible. And again, they come from very dry, very difficult parts of the world for plants and they're tough as nails. And they'll come back year after year, as long as you don't do two things that are fatal. You don't feed them and you don't water them in summer. They like to be dry and they like to be ignored. Be like decent well-drained soil, but they don't want fertilizer. That actually causes them to go mushy. Lots of wild things do not like fertilizer. They're not used to it. And so it's much better to um, ignore them as much as possible. Benign neglect is the principle we wanna go for here, right? The other plant that is blooming right now and covered with bees is this beautiful creature, which is the Lily of the Valley shrub or Pieris, and they come in different colors, pink, uh, red, white, mostly that, but, um, but they're bee magnets. And it's pretty great because they're one of the earliest shrubs to bloom. And when you have a big shrub, it's loaded and you'll see tons and tons of bees and other pollinators busy on it anytime it's not raining <laughs> or freezing cold. Um, 
the hedge next door to me is eight feet tall. And I think it makes a really nice evergreen uh, hedge for areas where you don't need a giant, you know, God forbid it should be English laurels or something like that. They can be kept to a modest size very easily, but they do grow into a sizable plant and make a very pleasant uh, low screen. And eight feet is usually plenty for a garden screen. You get much more than that and you start getting into um, problems with losing light and air circulation in the garden as well. So I'd said that I was gonna talk about do's and don'ts um, because <laughs> I can't even tell you how many people said, oh, whoops, I pruned my roses and then it froze again and now the tops are dead. It's like, well, yeah. So if you did get a little carried away, and I have to say February is often a time when it is appropriate to prune roses, but this year because of the frosts, that, the continuing frosts, um, which we did have actually some warning about, uh, that made it a, not a good choice. And so what you wanna do now is wait just a little longer. You'll see a lot of them are putting out leaves um, and you can go to a pair, a, a pair of strong leaves, not just the littlest buds, but go to above a pair of strong leaves on a rose plant and cut at an angle, a tilted angle, not flat because the tilted angle allows rain to run off and cut pretty close, maybe an inch at the most above that set of leaves. And that will heal off instead of letting rainwater in to rot and make more of a problem. Um, so you can now prune your roses, uh, but again, be a little cautious about um, anything super tender is still gonna show damage and be cautious about taking off like you'll see rosemary, a lot of times the tips will have die back because that the bitter wind actually gives them wind burn as much as anything. And when it's, you know, 17 or 20 degrees and the wind is blowing, that's when you'll see damage on things like the hardy herbs, which are, they are hardy, but they still can have a hard time. In some cases, the more tender rosemaries will lose a whole chunk. And that includes a lot of the uh, prostrate ones that spill over the edges of walls and things like that. They are generally speaking not as hardy, but I noticed around town that some of them look fine and they usually are in a more of a sheltered spot. Um, one thing that helps them is not getting direct east sunlight because after a deep freezing night, when the sun hits tender or somewhat half hardy plants, the water in their cells can literally blow up and that blows up the leaves and that causes them a lot of damage, but if they get to thaw out a little bit and it gets up even into the, uh, you know, high 20s, low 30s before the sun hits them, that's better for them than, because I hope that makes sense. Um, but that's why you really want to think about where you position some of those things that are kind of half hardy, that they um, get time to kind of come and moderate the temperature before the sun comes onto them, if it should actually shine, which it doesn't always, right? <laughs> The other piece I was going to say is um, about fertilizer. So many people get ramped up and they think they want to fertilize everything in sight and they start doing it in January even or February and really that's too early. For one thing, the soil is still really cold and day temperatures don't always reflect night temperatures and night temperatures are more closely linked to soil temperatures. And so even if it's 50 something in the day, if it's going down into the 30s or low 40s at night, um, the soil is still pretty cold. And that means the roots are growing, certainly, but they're not taking up nutrients in the same way. And if you read the bags of some kinds of fertilizer, you'll notice a lot of them say to be used when the, uh, in, when the weather, when the temp day temperatures are in the 70s, 70 or above. Well, sometimes that doesn't happen here all summer, but uh, what you wanna avoid is dumping on a bunch of fertilizer that plants can't take up. And then we get one of those days in May when suddenly the temperature soars, those pelletized fertilizers especially will dump on a hot day. And sometimes you'll see burning on the plant or even root death because that sudden temperature releases so much um, of the fertilizer that it, it's actually damaging to the plants. So you're much better off with a slow, steady, low temper, low number fertilizer, like a 555 or, you know, anything 10, 10, 10 and over is not appropriate to use on say ferns or wildflowers or a lot of shade plants. Um, mosses, uh, one of my a friend said she had a 
couldn't figure out this mysterious thing that had happened to some of the mosses in her shade garden. And it turned out she was fertilizing some of her plants and had spilled a bunch of the fertilizer and it actually killed big patches of the moss because um, it's too intense. Um, they like it slow and steady. So compost mixed with aged manure or even with fine shredded bark, that's a good feeding mulch that's mild and slow and isn't gonna overwhelm. Now, there are a few plants that really do want to be fed more and, and that would be rhododendrons, um, especially in, in their shade garden, but you can give them coffee grounds, which are quite high in nitrogen and not quick release. And so that's a nice slow release and a nice way to reuse your coffee grounds. Do take the filters out because it looks so tacky, but the coffee itself, once you've used it, um, will be a good slow release of nitrogen over a long period of time. So I'm hoping some of you have some questions for me because I could just sit here and yak and I might never hit what you want. <laughs> and I, th there was something uh, I saw online. It was about using cut toilet paper tubes and you kind of snip at the bottom and fold them together so they're a little cup and then use them like to start seeds in. Have you seen anything like that? No, I would want to be a little careful about that because some cardboards are treated, the glue on the cardboard that, you know, it's a spiral. And so they're, mm -hmm. they're glued together. Sometimes the glue is actually fairly toxic on cardboards. Ah, uh, if yeah. it goes through a hot composting cycle first, then that's one thing. But if you're just using it direct, um, you'd want to be sure that the paper and I mean that the cardboard wasn't treated with anything. And you, if it's white, it's been bleached. Sometimes they also have plasticizing agent, even on the toilet paper rolls. I'm something of uh, an expert on toilet paper rolls because my daughter-in-law teaches art and Rita's nodding um, and collects all kinds of tubes and things for the kids uh, to use in their projects. And we have literally had hundreds and hundreds of paper, uh, paper rolls of various kinds delivered and I sort them by color and type. And I've discovered that some of them, you know, they're not all created equal. And I read some articles about composting cardboard and realized that the um, not the, any cardboard that has plastic, like a brightly colored, shiny, glossy um, logo or, or you know signage on the top, that must like even in egg cartons, oftentimes they have this brightly printed and it's very shiny and glossy um, sticker kind of on the front. You got to take that off before you recycle it or put it in the compost, which you can do. It can go in the green waste, actually, um, as long as it doesn't have any of that plasticized material still sticking to it. Um, okay. So I would sort of do, but you know, you, if you really wanna do little something like that, use an egg carton, use the bottom of an egg carton to start your seed. Yeah. The other thing you can do, and we're, oh, here it is. Um, so I like to use, I don't actually buy them this way, but several people have donated them to me. It's the plastic boxes that lettuce comes in, yeah? Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they make a nice little mini greenhouse. You get a skewer and you poke holes in it. And then you put just a little, you can see maybe an inch, inch and a half of um, potting soil on it. And then you can sprinkle, these are um, a mixture of cabbage and radish seedlings. And you can see the first leaves are not what, they don't look like mom because they're this, what's called seed leaves. So the first leaves um, may be uncharacteristic and then the second set will be true leaves. And, and on from there. But these are great because you can um, keep the lid just slightly open and it will allow air and circulation, but it doesn't let them dry out and drying out is a problem. And if it's a warm day, you can flip the top open and put a little something on it so it doesn't flip back. Um, and that is really a great way to keep track of, you know, to bring your little babies on. And when they're a little bigger, you can what's called prick them out into two inch pots and on into a four inch pot if you like. Interestingly, if you take too small of a seedling and put it into too large of a pot, they often struggle, um, probably because what, what the theory is, is that um, in, in a large volume of soil in a pot, if uh, the air circulation is uneven and water tends to run down the sides and they're not getting an even distribution of, of, of water or air to the roots. I don't know, but it is true that um, a, a little plant in a two inch pot will grow really nicely. And then you can just squeeze the bottom and pop it out and give it a bigger pot, maybe a four inch. And I always set them at an angle so that instead of straight, because at an angle in the four, in the bigger pot, you can stuff the sides and you'll get a lot more soil into it than if you're trying to do it flat around the edge. Does that make sense? 
-hmm. Now, can we leave them in the uh, salad, plastic salad thing, or um, until they get the start getting their second leaves? Oh yeah, and actually, some people just grow greens this way, and you can get your nail scissors. I didn't sew them that thickly because I was planning to transplant them. But mm -hmm. if you want to do microgreens, you just dump a whole package of, and it's a great way to use up a packet of seeds from a few years ago, where you're like radishes. Oh, I don't know. They might not be good anymore. You can just put them in with maybe some broccoli seeds or some, you know, other things of that arugula, lettuce that you're not sure of. And then you'll get this, you know, some of them will come up and you can snip them with nail scissors and put them in your salads or in a pizza sandwich or whatever. Um, but it's a nice little way to do microgreens inside. Oh, that's a great idea. Yeah. Oh, uh, uh, Susan Hassan Miller had a, uh, a question. We have a side area of the lawn under a tree where nothing will grow and i'm thinking of planting mini clover in that area have you ever used mini clover yeah um there's quite a lot of different clovers and when you're looking to use them in a garden situation they usually are pretty much a sun plant not entirely but for, for the most part they do best in sun usually you're going to want an annual clover because one of the hardest plants in the garden to eradicate is a perennial clover and usually they didn't come because you planted them um, but if you're looking for a cover crop and you want to improve the, the clovers like all the legumes are going to improve the soil quality but in a deep shady situation i would probably just sprinkle humic acid which you can buy granulated like at rite aid or um ace has it always humic acid is one of the components of compost it's one of the things that change it's not a fertilizer as such but it's a soil builder and it improves the quality of soil helps it to it sounds contradictory, but it helps it to retain water and allow air passage because it improves the, the uh, hand of the soil, the uh, texture. This area does get a lot of afternoon sun. Okay, afternoon sun's pretty hard on a lot of plants. I'm wondering why nothing will grow there. Is it perhaps under a large tree? Yeah, it's uh, it's under uh, uh, under a tree, a couple trees. What kind of trees? Uh, first. Yeah, so part of the issue there is going to be that they have um, put their roots out and have taken up all the root space. Now, with big evergreens, you know, it's a bit tricky to, if you dump a bunch of soil on top and plant into it, it'll probably work for one year, but their roots will continue to grow up into it, especially cedars, but um, firs as well. And the other thing is you don't want to ever heap too much soil around the neck of an evergreen tree, even a big one, because that will literally smother it. So when they, when you look at a, a big evergreen, they usually have a fairly cylindrical straight trunk, but then at the bottom it will swell out and that would be the equivalent of where the neck meets the shoulders. And that, and then the roots are going to be spreading all underneath that. And that is where you want the soil. No, to that's, um, it's, where the branches come out over the area. It's mm. not up close to the trees. Right, I'm just saying if you put in extra soil, you wanna be sure that you're not taking it all the way to the, no. tr the tree. But yeah. I'm also saying it's gonna be a little tricky to get things to grow under, um, under evergreens that have been there a long, long time. For one thing, as their needles fall, it makes the soil pretty acid. Now compost is a good balance for that because it's neutral in pH and it helps neutralize the soil. So um, aged mature compost, again, mixed maybe with some medium or fine grain, um, not bark chips, but shredded wood chips, it would be a good uh, way to get that soil to start to come back. And you could certainly try an annual clover crop there. Um, doesn't, you know, it, mini clover, of course, is smaller and a good ground cover and see if it will take. Um, and you could sow that now, just if you raked out the compost mixture and let it get wet, wet it down if it doesn't rain. And then you can just broadcast the clover and then really lightly rake over it. You don't need to plant it as such because it's one of those seeds that does just fine when it has light and air. Mm. Okay. I've got a question about trees, Anne. Okay. Um, um, I, um, I'm building a uh, boxes that are two feet high for my wife so she doesn't have to bend over anymore and for uh -huh. me especially but uh we have an apple there's an apple tree at the pea patch which you probably know about it's a very very old one and i wanted it she's got that little spot there and i'm always wondering about you mentioned about putting dirt down <clears throat> on top of tree roots um i wanted to raise that to about two feet 
but then I started reading that you couldn't, it wasn't a good idea to put all that dirt on top of roots. So that's my first question. Or is there an alternative way to build a box that is be like a foot above the ground with airspace underneath it and save it? I don't want to, I don't want to mess with that tree. Yeah, there's a couple of things you can do. And one is um, use a trough, like a, a watering trough, like we have at the senior center. We have three of the big stock tanks, um, which by the way, if anybody wants to rent one for a season, you um, talk to Mary at the senior center about that. Um, but troughs are usually, you elevate the drill holes in the bottom, of course, because even though they have one drain hole, that's not enough. And you don't want a lot of wet soil building up at the bottom because it gets sour and it uh, leads to a lot of mold and mildew problems. But once you get some drainage in those things, and I crock them with broken pots and things, the holes, so they remain free. And then you put it up on concrete blocks or bricks, making sure, again, you're not covering the holes. You just took all the trouble to drain, to uh, drill and then fill it with soil, they're great because you don't bend over and they're um, a, signif a significant volume of soil. They each hold about a cubic yard or more, um, which is what you want for a decent soil depth for all kinds of, mm. of edibles, especially, um, but things like carrots and beets really don't do well in four or five inches of soil. They need a lot more depth than that. And the other advantage is that they're made of galvanized metal and they don't, um, have any wood treatment the way some kinds of wood of course are going to be putting copper and whatnot into the soil and it can go as far as 15 to 18 inches into the soil beds which doesn't leave you much plantable space in a planter box um, and then the wood like cedar that's not treated also sometimes has a, a retarding effect on plants at least for the first few years just because of the volatile oils in cedar wood um, so I do like troughs myself and like I said they're really great for not bending over if you want to go take her to the senior center and take a look at the, um, the, the love troughs and let her have a, a sense of what that might look like. Okay, and then how high off the ground would I want it to be? I'm worried about the roots of the tree. You just, you just need a few inches. So a brick, you know, four, six bricks usually is what I use for a big trough like that because they are like six, six feet long. Um, and you could put extra ones at the ends because it's a lot of weight, of course, on that. But, but the tree doesn't need you know, a foot of air. In fact, that will just, if that's in that garden, what you'll find is if you put them up a foot, you'll probably get kale and garlic and lemon balm growing underneath it because that's what's in that soil. <laughs> well, and I can't just, I can't just put a foot or two feet of dirt directly on top of the roots. Okay. That's it's better not to um, because, you know, that older trees too, that's a bit of a shock for them and, and not super good for them. Okay. Thanks. That's a great solution. Uh, Laura and yeah, Barney had a question. Blueberries. Oh. I'm Wait. sorry. Laura Go ahead. And I'll do Laura and Bonnie after you, Nancy. Okay. okay. Go ahead, Nancy. I was hi. I was wondering about blueberry plants. When to um, fertilize them, and <laughs> when to prune them, and just kind of general blueberry. Are these high bush blueberries or low bush blueberries? In other words, are they six feet high or are they more like two or three feet? No, high? no, they're lower. They're lower. You shouldn't really need to prune them at all, except to remove any dead wood. Um, mm -hmm. The lower ones that are bred to be low bush blueberries generally don't need a lot of, um, of thinning. And especially the ones that are especially bred to be in containers, those almost never need pruning at all. Um, and they don't need a lot of fertilizing either. They're, again, it, you know, plants that don't really... Um, want high number of fertilizers at all. And if you put too much nitrogen on them, they tend to go to flower and leaf and not much fruit. So a balanced, you know, like a 555, mm -hmm. 575, that would be okay. But 10, 10, 10 is probably a little too much for them. Um, and I wouldn't put it on until March or April. Usually, you know, the time with fruit, fruiting plants, you want to feed them is when they start, um, you can watch the little... <laughs> buds starting to swell and you can see that they're starting to get ready to have flowers, that's when you want to fertilize them so that they have the energy to go through the whole process of blooming and then being fertilized and forming fruit. That's what they need their energy for. Not so much now when they're just budding out leaves. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sure. Perfect. Just a oh, second. Okay. Laura and then, uh, and then John. Yeah, Laura had, a, she wanted to know, is it, uh, is it an okay time to put down compost and mulch our beds. 
Bonnie is also thinking of using the fishy stuff. Is that too strong or okay? Okay, it, yes, it's a great time to put down compost um, on the beds. I've been doing that myself and it's kind of mixing in with, I put a lot of leaves and things on in the fall and then in the spring kind of mix that up with more compost. Um, I've been re renovating a little bed in the pea patch where Dave, Dave's wife has her um, patch there too. And it was horrible soil because the previous person had, when they left, took all the topsoil off. <laughs> and, and so I had subsoil. So I've been making new soil there and the humic acid really helps a lot. And then putting compost on, and I did grow lots of peas and beans last year to um, help as well. When you do that, of course, you want to um, not pull the plant, but cut the cut them at the base and leave the roots because that's where all the stored nitrogen nodules really are. But um, as far as the fishy stuff, it is pretty strong. Um, if it's well aged and doesn't really, you know, it's not steaming, you can use it. Sometimes it comes a little hot and you want to let it rest for a bit on a tarp because it can be a little hot for young, like lettuce seedlings could get kind of burned. Does that make sense? But I'll tell you who loves that is tomatoes and peppers and big plants and those prima donna piglets that like lots of good strong nutrients. It's great for that. Um, you could cut it half and half with just, mm. you can get those EB stone bales of compost mix at um, Bainbridge Gardens and cut and mix it half and half if you wanted to put it on things that were a, a little more tender or young. Is that helpful? Yeah, yep, that sounds good. Okay, Thank you. Thank John. You. Um, my question is about weed control. Um, we have a lot of weed seedlings coming up in the driveway. Is uh, in in on Bainbridge Island? Is it legal to use a flamethrower? Yes, it is. Oh yes, um, and it's great to use a flamethrower. But I have several pieces of advice about that. Um, one is if you have any teenagers in the neighborhood, you can hire them, and they love doing it. Um, <laughs> it's like hormonally thrilling. But the other thing is that if you do it yourself, you want to walk backwards because I've melted two pairs of Crocs doing that. Because um, when you're walking forward and you forget, that stuff is still hot. Um, one thing I found when I, um, at the Sequoia Center where I used to garden was we had a big wall made out of recycled concrete slabs that looked like stone because it was all cut. Um, but it was full of sl slugs and snails lived in there. But if you take your flamethrower and flame the wall, it actually... Um, kills the eggs too. It's kind of fun. Yeah. The other thing to keep in mind is that flammable things are still flammable. I <laughs> have mm. a friend in Portland who's told me about this story about doing a very elaborate garden for a, a client and the client called a few weeks later and said, I need you to come back and redo the garden. And she said, and she said, well, yeah, my husband went out and uh, did the flamethrower thing and he set all the bark paths on fire and it burned up most of the plants. So oh, you no. do want to, I know, right? You do want to be a little mindful. And actually in the big caterpillar years, when we had those horrible caterpillars, several people in Kitsap set their homes on fire trying to blaze the caterpillar. I mean, so you just want to remember it is an open flame. It is pretty hot. This is not a creme brulee top thing. They're major heat. Um, yeah, I, Bonnie got one. <laughs> I've, I've been using uh, flamethrower for quite a few years, but then last year I read something about the fire department saying that we should not use a flamethrower on Bainbridge. So uh, I thought I'll ask. You can look, when you drive past the, the fire station, the main fire station, they have a sign out front that tells you the level of fire mm -hmm. danger. And if it's high, then yeah, I wouldn't. But at this time of year, it's not high. Like we're going to do a program later on this year, the fire department and uh, who else? The city. And they've asked me to help them kind of put together lists of how to protect your home from wildfire, because that can happen here. Um, runaway fires are not unknown at all in communities like ours, where there are lots of big trees and lots of um, downed material. It does not mean you, if you have wooded, a wooded property that you go in and strip everything off the ground, that's not appropriate or healthy for anything. But it does mean you don't leave a whole lot of deadfall and that you think about what you make. I always like to have the home be like sitting in a golden bowl of light and all the greenery making walls around the edges of it, but not crammed up in front of it like so many of us, you know, have inherited. Um, and make sure you've got light and air all around the house and that you don't plant very flammable things around the house. And there are lists 
like that, that from the um, Department of Natural Resources. And Hillary Franz has done an amazing job of posting things like that too, of fire safety um, gardening. Uh, you can look online and find them. Um, that was probably more than you really wanted to know, but yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> no, that's, that's important. I mean, it, uh, keeping our home safe and, uh, you know, in the wild, for the, us and the wildlife, uh, you know, keeping our trees and whatnot, it, you know, it, a wildfire can happen anywhere. It can. And if we have one of those, uh, what they call heat domes, like we did last year, that just dried everything out so terribly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And our native trees have been pretty stressed. I know, you know, after we've had quite a, uh, some pretty major wet storms, it's hard to remember that we actually had four or five years of drought significant enough to start making big leaf maples die and giving cedars trouble. And even some of the firs and things have been showing a lot of stress because, you know, that that's a shift in what they're used to. And all over the island, you can see young dead trees um, that were drought stressed and dying. And of course that's tinder basically. Mm -hmm. So if you have that kind of situation, you might want to take it at least, um, like if you take a, a big tree down and leave eight feet, that's really good habitat for woodpeckers and whatnot. But but it's not a super big fire threat. Um, the other thing to think about if you are going to take down a tree or you have to, as we do in my neighborhood, we have to take down a cedar which was planted years ago between two mobile homes which are quite close together and it's already crushing the gutter on one side and it's in completely enveloped the power pole which is tilting but not going anywhere because it's very strongly held. <laughs> but and it's now about an inch away from the home on the other side. And it just, it's not an appropriate thing to have there. Um, so we have to take that down. And I was reminded that the tribe, if you have to take a cedar down, they always ask, it's, it's possible that you take it down when the native dogwood is blooming, which is usually somewhere between March, April, um, maybe into May, depending on the year. And they can, at that time, that's when the cedar bark is most easily harvested, most successfully harvested. And they like the, to take the bark and the limbs and as much of the wood as is available and they use every single bit of it. Um, so just a tip, right? You can get a hold of Tina Jackson at the Suquamish tribe and she can um, tell you what needs to happen. Joan, it looked like you had a question at one point, did you? Joan? Yes, yes. Oh. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, what do you know about the butterfly weed? Oh, okay. Is that the orangey one? Yeah. Yeah. So there are a number of different kinds of what we call butterfly weeds. Right? Where do I plant it? Well, just a sec, because I want to. <laughs> so <laughs> there are some native ones, even here in, in, in Washington, mostly on the eastern side, but there are also some places where they grow pretty well. I got a good stand going at Eagle Harbor Church. If you ever want to take a look at it in summertime, you can see there's um, a, a patch of the native uh, showy butterfly weed there that has actually got butterflies on it, not necessarily monarchs, but other butterflies too. Um, but that one that you're showing me the picture of with the bright orange and yellow flowers can be a problem for non-monarch butterflies. And so they were suggesting that you actually don't plant that. Okay. Um, and I'm trying to remember what it was and I can't remember anymore, but there was some toxicity issue with it. It's native in Texas South and I think bits of Baja California maybe. Um, but even there, there was something going on with it. I cannot, I'm sorry that I don't remember exactly what it was, but there was an, uh, Xerxes Society warning put out about it. Do, are you all familiar with the Xerxes Society? It's X-E-R-C-E-S um, dot org. And it's been protecting pollinators for about 56 years. And it's a wonderful resource online. They have regional and state by state lists of good plants for all kinds of pollinators, um, ways to create habitat, things that will protect um, and promote healthy pollinators. It's a great site, X-E-R-C-E-S dot org, I think. Um, so take a look at that because it's wonderful. So but, Anne? Yeah. Anne, that, so then I got this from Bay Hay and Feed. So I'm, mm -hmm. I have the receipt yet. So I'm just going to take it back to them. Yeah. And I'll try to find the thing that what it. Um, yeah. What the problem is. But let's not worry here, maybe about you, it. you can look. It's toxicity of orange milkweed. 
Could you look that up and see if you can find something? Um, I'm sorry that oh, I, I not I'm not, but that's just what I'm going to do. So I'll, yeah. I'll trade this for something else. Yeah. And one thing you could think about, we have some beautiful native plants at our beautiful annuals. And one of them is Clarkia or Farewell to Spring. Here's the packet for Clarkia doubles. Um, okay. That's I'll a native plant. That. Yeah. <laughs> and there's another one called Baby Blue Eyes, which is beautiful. Oh, a little yes. native. Yes. Yeah. And then one of my favorites, California poppies are native up onto the oh, islands and along the coast. And I look at the colors. Oh, beautiful. In Montana, like you don't believe. Yeah, they're gorgeous. And and these, you know, the colorful forms are really beautiful. And, you know, native pollinators, they've been some interesting studies about, uh, the, you know, there were groups of people who felt that if you planted anything in your garden that wasn't native, you were doing a criminal act. And I thought, really? Um, that yeah. pollinators need poll native plants. Well, it turns out most pollinators are opportunists and they will, for preference, visit native plants in their season. But a lot of our native plants bloom early and peter out. And what, what has been discovered is that if then you have an overlap with a lot of exotics that might be native from other parts of the country or native from other parts of the world, but they grow here, that preferentially European honeybees will visit those first and our native bees will visit those second. But as the season proceeds, basically as long as, if you can have the more flowers you can have in bloom for the longer time, the more pollinators you will have of all kinds. Is that all right? And there are a few types, like there are special blueberry bees that really only go to that family but there are many other bees that will go to blueberries and many other families. We have about 400 species of native bees in Washington and none of them are colonial as such and they are not hive bees that make batches of honey um, the way European honeybees do, which are actually African in origin. But our bees, like bumbles create small stashes. Actually, they're adorable. They create honey pots and the mother bumble, the queen mother will have her eggs in a little um, little nest and she will lie on it with her tummy on the eggs, keeping them warm. And she really? leaves over like a housewife watching soaps yeah. and bonbons. She'll scoop the honey and feed herself through the, um, well, <laughs> through the spring until the eggs are ready to hatch. How cute is that? I have got to tell you, I saw a bumblebee about a week ago yeah. on my deck. Yeah. And I also want to tell you that last year, last fall, I was sitting on the deck and of course I have a few flowers and all of a sudden, honest to God, this huge yellow butterfly showed up. Where it came from, I've never seen a yellow butterfly. Was it solid yellow? Solid yellow. Because um, well, there are, we have Western monarchs that are yellow and black, um, but it can, well, you know, it's also possible that sometimes you know you get uh, we get um, maybe get a call call erratics. Like when I saw a scarlet tanager at the post office one time, and oh. you know this isn't really their territory, but you'll get them. There are occasionals right that come from other oh. places, um, and it could be that. Well, it's amazing. Yeah, yeah it is good. We at the it's library. At the library for the last couple of weeks, the um, the flowering currants have started to just started to bloom, and they are already busy with hum with uh, big fat bumblebees are all over those, and they are on oh, that um, the pieris, the lily of the valley shrub I showed you earlier. They're so totally interested in that too. Thank you. So it says, uh, how would I clear my drain field from awful grasses and then plan a more meadow type uh, field? Yeah, that's hard. Um, so awful grasses can be tough because you really have to dig them out because their flamethrower won't help you with that. Most grasses are, are um, acclimated to fire, you know, prairies and things, go, fires go through and they don't, it doesn't kill them. It can knock them back, but it's not going to kill the roots. So they would have to be manually removed. And there are jobs like that, which I think in the sustainable principle there is to cause it to be done by others. <laughs> So hire a strapping young person and let them do all the removal and then put compost and so forth back on. And then you can sow something like that mini clover or, um, you know, you want to make sure that whatever you put on your drain field does not have deep roots. 
because mm -hmm. obviously you root penetration into a drain field can be a, a huge problem for the drain field. And I knew someone who was growing miniature apple trees on their drain field. And I was like, yeah, really? You know, heavy metals in human waste are just not optimal additions to our diet. So I would say don't grow anything edible on your drain field. Um, you could certainly do different kinds of um, ground covers. If it's somewhat shady, you could grow epimedium. You know, that would be a beautiful evergreen ground cover. Or you could look for some of the evergreen native clovers, um, sorrels, that would work too. Um, there are grasses, of course, that, that will be less um, ratty looking, but mowing a drain field can be a problem if it's, a, if it's one of those um, hump drain, what do you call them? You know, yeah, mounded, drains, yeah. Blended mounds, yeah. But if yeah. they're flat, yeah, you can just put in a good playground mix or something like that and just mow it. And it, no matter what it is, the more you mow a lawn, it, it favors for fine textured grasses. So if you have a weedy, ratty looking lawn with lots of strappy, um, robust grasses, if you mow it more often, it will sh it will actually start to favor the finer textured grasses and the older ones will die out and you'll get a more lawn-like lawn um, over time. If you well, know. thank you, Julie. Thanks for that question. Yeah. And we also have a Janet, she's a, my large, Climbing jasmine's leaves are uh, turning deep red from the heat wave. Should I trim off the leaves? This is outdoors or indoors? Uh, I assume it's outdoors. Yeah, right, it's Janet? Outdoors. Okay. Right. Yeah. So um, heat, red coloration and foliage is a nature's sunscreen, essentially. Um, and it was trying to shield itself from that heat, which... God, you know, is it was pretty bad, right? Um, but you don't need to cut them off. They will be replaced. And the leaves are still functional. And the plant, after going through the summer we had and the winter we had, I'd say most of our plants need all the help they can get. And rather than removing the leaves, I mean, unless they're brown and withered and actually snap off with a finger, just leave them until the new growth uh, uh, re will replace them. And that will, um, you know, slowly take care of it. hope that is clear. Mm -hmm. Let's see. This is from Dave. Uh, we have a small patch of lawn that we have uh, we have let go natural, and now we have a lot of buttercups. Oh, I oh. love buttercups. By the way, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. I'm I mean, not opposed to buttercups. What I want to know is whether I can throw a bunch of uh, flower seed in there and and get things to grow. The short answer is no. Oh, uh, no. Well, if you have a lot of buttercups, you have probably acid clay soil with poor drainage because that is optimal for both buttercup and bindweed. Hello. Yeah. Um, and nettles and things like that. And if you just let an area go and it turns to buttercups, that means you have a drainage issue. So you might want to trench it a little bit, um, you know, and maybe have a little rain garden near there so that you can put trenches into the rain garden, put a little gravel in them, then you can plant over, you know, put fresh compost and soil mix over the top of that. And then, yeah, then you can start planting wild flowers. Um, actually, blueberries love that kind of damp, meadowy, yes. and, you know, they, you could have miniature blueberries along the side of that and everybody would be happy with that. Um, but wildflower mixes, it really depends on what you have to offer them, how well they do. They, they can't compete against grasses at all, especially, um, the, but if you grow, specific types of wildflowers in flats and then size them up in four inch pots and then cut um, strips of the turf out and roll it up like a jelly roll and remove it. And you can plant into those strips and keep them clear and then gradually re remove the grass and have these other things that will work pretty well. Um, this is not, you know, meadow country really, like down south, Tacoma where you get into those oaky savannas, yeah, it is. And there are certain places like up by Squim where you'll see some natural meadow type of areas. This is Climax Forest. It still is, even though we're not doing that anymore. Um, and the soil is, that's the other thing to think about is like where there's been forest for a long time, the soil is going to be fungally based because that's what trees and woody plants prefer and that's what they create, right? And even though you take the trees out, it takes like a really long time to change the soil over to bacterially based, which is what a meadow would be. Um, 
this is probably more than you really want to hear. But the point is, transitioning from a forested type space to an open garden meadow, that's partly why we have to kind of work our soil pretty heavily here, because by nature, it wants to do one thing and we're asking it to do something quite different. Um, but compost is your best friend in all these things. Drainage and compost are gonna be really important. Okay, hey, thanks. Yeah, sorry, that's not easier. But again, you know, you can hire young people and, and boost the economy. Yes, <laughs> I like the way you think. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else got a burning wish? Uh, wow. I, yeah. I was just going to say, um, I did plant my peas out because I think I talked last time about how you don't put your peas out until the li local lilac leaves are the size of a mouse's ear, which is about the size of your little pinky finger, or mine anyway. Um, Many people who have cats know perfectly well what a mouse's ear looks like because the cats leave mice on the, you know. But if you don't, um, just imagine a little pinky fingernail and that's about the size you want. Well, when I went out to look two weeks ago, there was no bud in sight. And last week, there were not just leaf buds, but you could actually see the buds of the flowers. The blossom um, mm. are, is already in place and starting to swell. So I planted my peas out and they're actually doing great. Um, and, <laughs> you know, St. Patrick's Day, some people think it's the traditional day to do that, but it really depends because we have had sleet and snow and freezing temperatures on St. Patrick's Day. So the lilac is a better indication because it's a, it's not a, a plant that responds to day length as much as uh, ambient average temperatures. Mm -hmm. So it's an indicator plant for a lot of like greens and um, that like yeah, different kinds of peas and stuff like that, which also means you could start your sweet peas now. Um, I'd soak them in just tepid water for an hour or so before you plant them. And then they don't need peas and, and beans are pretty much self-fertilized. I mean, uh, yeah, self-fertilizing because they're nitrogen fixers and, and they draw a lot of nitrogen out of the air and store it in their roots. And so they don't need fertilizer as such, but they really do appreciate a well-drained, well-fed soil. And so oh, my granddaughter's here, as you can see. Oh, hi. <laughs> Granny, shut up. Come play with me. <laughs> but um, so it's a good time to put those things out. It's a little early for beans. I wouldn't get beans started yet unless you have a place to keep them indoors for ooh, probably a good month. Beans, tomatoes, peppers, all those plants are waiting for, you want to wait until the soil temperature is at least 55. That's the magic number. And I know you can go to the nursery and buy tomato plants, but resist, 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 unless you have a greenhouse to keep them in or, a, you know, a sunny window that you don't mind losing because <laughs> the plants are going to be huge by the time um, the soil's warm enough to put them out. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I, hear, I always hear around July around here. There's a lot of... It's some it's years, there. you know, Mother's Day is another one of those traditional ones, but that is... Mm -hmm. iffy. Um, and the soil temperature test. And, you know, most of us have phones that will tell you all about the, the night temperature. And again, night temperatures indicate soil temperatures pretty closely. So when your phone tells you that night temperatures are in the 50s, in the mid 50s, um, that's when you can start thinking about planting those tropicals. Because things like beans, they'll just rot um, or mold. It, they're not amused by low temperatures. Peas are fine. They're perfectly happy with low temperatures. And so are things like arugula and a lot of the greens and lettuces, bok choy, which can be tricky around here. Um, the choys don't like high temperatures at all. They're cool season crops. Um, so this is a great time to get them going. Mm, love the bok choy. Yeah. Yeah, I'm looking here like uh, the nighttime temperature for Saturday is, next Saturday is 35 degrees. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, it's down in the low 40s to, yeah. And again, the peas were fine. I was seeing today when I was picking the flowers to show you, um, I've got sweet peas, self-sown sweet peas in the garden that, you know, the last year I let some of them set seed because I always collect the seed and some of them just spilled on the ground and, and planted themselves and they're up like crazy and the nasturtiums are up like crazy and they'll be fine. Um, but, you know, they'll be early birds, right? So anything you plant now should be going pretty good by the time you want to see the flowers on them in May and June. Right, yeah, excellent. What, sorry if I could jump in. When, yeah. when you were mentioning 
planting arugula and getting some of those starts. Are you, are you talking about outside or inside? I start them inside in my little um, container. Yeah, your terrarium. <laughs> yeah, my terrarium. Um, because I can keep track of them better that way. And outside, especially, you know, with if you're just renovating your beds and stuff, they can get lost pretty easily. And it's always good to remember that a lot of those teeny seeds, they don't want to be covered particularly, um, just barely. Because if you bury them too deep, they don't really, they don't succeed or they take a really long time to come up because they're working, they're working so hard to get up to the top. Um, so the, the little terrarium method is a great starter kit. And then you can start moving them up to bigger and bigger pots. And then if they've been indoors, like I have an unheated greenhouse sort of sunroom and I usually move them into that and they get very cold there at night, but not quite as cold. So they're sheltered and that helps harden them off so they can go from there out into the garden. But if you have them indoors on a windowsill, like beans later, then you need to harden them up before they actually go into the garden. Because if you just take something that's used to whatever your house temperature is, I mean, mine's 65, but some people are 70 or 75. And then you put them outside and they go down to low night temperatures. They're not going to be happy about that. They'll get stunted mm -hmm. and they literally can lose ground. Plants, um, especially the heat lovers, tomatoes and peppers, will not only stop growing when the, they get a temperature shock, but sometimes they will not ungrow. That's silly, but they get uh, damaged to the point where it takes them a while to catch up to where they were when you put them out. So giving them a few hours of daylight, bringing them back in, giving them a little more, um, and staging them out and out, and then leaving them the first night, it takes about a week. Then the first night you leave them out, you might put them right against the house wall or on a covered porch or in the garage and so forth, so that you're getting them acclimated before you stick them out and make them face the real world. <laughs> okay, everybody. Thanks, Karen. Thank you, Anne.